The following is an excerpt from the audiobook Apocalypse Awakening. For the full story, click the link in the description below. Falling asleep is the worst part of the day. Getting out of bed is a close second. James attempted neither. He knew his head wouldn't let him get any rest this night. Sitting motionless in the dark, back pressed against the wall, he starkly recalled the drunken evening he and Lisa shared two months ago. She'd been upset at her recent breakup, and James, as always, had been the comforting shoulder for her to lean on as they whisked their way through the expensive bars in New Wellington's Tearo district. Lisa had been growing heavy-lidded, and wide smiled, and James had lent a not-too-steady hand on the walk back to the brother's empty apartment. There, she turned in the doorway, blonde hair fluttering in the wind, as the chill of the night brushed her rosy cheeks a deeper shade of red. He'd made some mediocre remark that she'd find hilarious for whatever reason, and Lisa placed a hand on his chest as she laughed. They both froze. Her smile dropped, but her eyes didn't, and he looked straight into that enchanting mix of green and brown that seemed to blend and grow dark the longer he stared. Then, he looked away. Away from the moment he'd been fantasizing about for months. He'd balked. James returned alone to his hotel room, bottle of cheap rum in hand, and as he sank further into his drink and the expanding trench of self-pity, he forged a firm conviction. Next time, he would act. There hadn't been a next time, and during the sleepless night, James had seen the truth. If Conway stayed in the picture, there never would be. The first ebbs of morning light were appropriately glum as James unzipped his pack on the opposite side of a room from Chase and Bayou, sleeping on their fold-out mats. James lifted the first piece of armour from his bag, the section for his left lower leg. The armour's interior magnets latched onto their pairs on the back of James's thermal leggings, the opposing polarisations making certain the piece attached in the right way. James pulled the rest of the leg piece around his calf, wrapping his leg in the steel squares before clipping the piece into its adjoining slot at the back. He followed the same process for his other leg and both arms before finishing with the chest and back sets, all clutching to him with magnets and clips. After donning the armour, James checked his belts, pouches for ammunition and tools, slipped on his helmet, gloves and armoured boots and stomped harder from the room than needed as Chase and Bayou stared. For once, it was the early light and not the clouds that hung grey in the sky as the sun mustered its daily strength. James exited the building's front to see plant-encrusted cars and skyscrapers slide out of their hazy morning hue. An eager chorus of birds chirped from their nestled windowsills and pole wires, and a cat darted across the street, hunting for the source of the bird song. It was so loud and uninterrupted that James imagined he was standing in a forest rather than a city centre. Sonny sat ahead on the corroding transformer that occupied the corner of the four-way intersection, an ideal spot for the night guard post. Sonny stood when he saw James emerge. Beautiful, isn't it? he asked, voice filtered through his helmet. You don't hear them any more. The birds? James asked. No, there's not this many in New Wellington. It's nice, man. Makes me feel better hearing them, you know? I mean, if no one's here, then at least something else will carry on living. Sure. Corporal Wainwright's already left. Said he had to get to the lookout before the Roebuck arrived. Crazy, isn't it? They'll be here in a couple hours. Yep, James said, feeling his lack of sleep catch up with him. Crazy. But we'll be out of here soon, right? He's talking too much. What do you think? Sonny asked, coming closer. We will be all right, won't we? Ah, that's why. Sonny was scared. While James had been stewing over his failures with Lisa, Sonny had been left by himself to dread the cruiser's arrival, and for good reason too. 
Sonny had finally realised the freelancer in action so far meant they'd been preparing for this day. It wasn't going to be easy getting out of here. Sure, James lied. Even without seeing Sonny's face, James could tell he hadn't been convincing, but there was nothing to be done about it. One thing was certain. If all went well and they left the island unscathed, then he'd lose Lisa. James heard a scratching noise and looked down. His glove's armour had scraped against the rifle in his hands when he'd tightened them just thinking about what was at stake. The squad. Sergeant Black. Conway. Did he really want every one of them to be on the roebuck by the end of the day? Did he really want to have a disgusting coffee at the start of the day? What else could he do? Gigor Manio's was the only coffee stand open this early in the morning, and his unadjusted body struggled to stay awake without caffeine, although the chill and his thin excuse for a jacket were helping push sleep far away. Fenn took a sip of burnt coffee and surveyed his surroundings as he crossed the wooden boardwalk. The low clouds were quickly dissipating to reveal more of the ship he walked across. So, this was what the upper deck of an Alliance cruiser looked like. Wide and long, featuring more artificial palm trees and a smaller pool area than he'd been expecting. He groggily shambled along the railing-clad deck, towards a raised platform where a group of men and women milled above the empty pastel-blue pool. Then. Parker waved from the midst of high-visibility shirted workers and proffered a hand up the free rungs ladder and through the railing's gate onto the platform. From up here, Fenn could see the bow of the ship ahead and the pool area behind, the jagged fort's executive bar reserved for the freelancers' upper echelon and their clients. A quick scan of the closed bar's drink menu confirmed that the exclusivity of the place had gone to the collective price's heads. What do you think? Parker asked. The view's a damn sight higher than the laundry level, wouldn't you say? It was as high as you could go, in fact, standing atop the boat-shaped cruiser, joining the three skyscrapers together at the roof. Fenn had always thought it an odd design, like Noah's Ark had been parked wrong as the floods retreated, leaving the boat stranded atop three giant stilts, hundreds of metres above sea level. It's not very lively. Fenn said, looking at the dead city and sleepy fort below. The only thing taller was the black volcanic slope to their left, and the fake cruiser's bridge looming behind, dominating the view to the... whatever compass point it happened to be on. I will admit, I've always been curious to come up here. A cruiser sitting on top of three skyscrapers is quite intriguing. That was part of the architect's plan, Parker said, looking over Fenn's shoulder at the elevator. When the Alliance moved to Prosperity, she decided to build a replica of the Alliance's first ever cruiser to capture the spirit of unity, or some bollocks. Properly pissed off a resort chain with the same sort of building in Singapore. People tend to get annoyed when you steal their gimmick. Fenn's words fell on uncaring ears as Parker strode to the platform's edge. Morning, gentlemen, he hollered. My thanks for joining us so early, although I'm afraid you'll have to stay down there. For your own health and safety. Health and safety? Am I so expendable it doesn't matter if I'm in harm's way? I can't come up there! Bullshit! Fenn groaned as he recognised the bark. This area is reserved for clan chiefs, isn't it? Says the guy who doesn't even qualify. Fenn turned to see Tonkai glaring at Parker from between two plastic sun loungers on the deck below, his teeth gritted and eye twitching in indignation. Wit stood next to him, arms, both whole and clamped, crossed together. Oh, Wit! Fenn shouted, raising a hand as he joined Parker at the railing. Wit's scarred face did little more than nod. You know the broken hand? Parker asked in a leaned whisper. I do, although he prefers broken boy, I think. Is it normal for so much shouting to occur before battle? Yuna asked, none too quietly herself, as she joined Wit and Tonky, closely trailed by Marie, fussing over her shock of silver hair. I've heard enough out of you, Baldy! Tonkai yelled. You're two millimetres away from Bald yourself. You say I can't come to you, so why is he there? 
Tonkai pointed an irate, pudgy finger towards Fen. You know I looked into this fearsome hero everyone's been talking about. Want to know what his job usually is? Guarding shipping containers at the docks where there hasn't been an attempted robbery in years. It's the easiest job there is. It wasn't that easy. It had taken Fen ages to memorize the supervisor's patrol times so he could catch naps without being caught. And you're going to let him up there, but not me? I don't think so. Don't you tell me what to do. I'll tell you what to do. Fen, Parker said, a wicked grin forming on his face. Does your broken mate down there have battle experience? What? Fen asked as he rotated his torso from side to side to try crack his back. His aching abs made him stop. Plan A. He was a frontliner. Just look at that scar and hand of his. That'll do. Parker cleared his throat and shouted. I've consulted with Fearsome, and he says we need Broken to advise us. And only him. Fen covered his laugh with an unconvincing cough as Wit gave his furious boss a worried look. He probably should have told Parker to stop antagonising the twitching heart attack waiting to happen, but damn it was funny. I don't, Wit started. This is an outrage, came the inevitable outburst. If you think my employee is going to follow your pipe down, Tonkai, Marie said with a venomous hiss, having finished perfecting the spacing between each strand of hair. If a defence manager says he needs him, then don't argue. Now get up there and get this show on the road, she said, turning and jabbing a finger in Wit's face. Or you can both explain to Arminius why you're distracting the gunners. Tonkai stormed off to the side, fists clenching and unclenching in a silent toddler-like tantrum, and Wit wore a frown less pleased than his bosses as he climbed the ladder, clamp clanging against the rungs. What's the matter with you two? Tonkai was annoyed enough with me before that stunt. Now he's going to be even worse. Maybe. I'd say it was worth it. Parker turned back to his group of yellow shirts. Now let's get ready, people. Our guests should be arriving at any moment. What a terrible start this has turned out to be, Wet grumbled. Agreed, Fenn said, taking a step back from two men wheeling a large portable console towards the poolside, trailed by a thick snake of cable. Hopefully the Alliance didn't catch any of that mess. Daniel could hardly believe the mess he'd just witnessed. The battle hadn't even started, and already the growing group of freelancers atop the three skyscrapers had started to argue and shout at one another. Daniel had been told of the freelancers' solid reputation, and there was always a clan available for missions too understaffed or too logistically difficult for the Alliance to handle. That reputation had suffered in recent years, and Daniel could see why, after that display on the replica Nimbus-class cruiser's deck. The black hull number beneath, one, had faded to grey, blending with the rest of the ageing cruiser's underbelly. Why were there so many people up there? Bayou's drone photographed the single-hulled ship yesterday, and there had been no weapons of any kind. Daniel adjusted his hands, and the world jumped as he swiveled the binos towards the fort's red walls. He was lying prone on the same rooftop he and Kai had scouted from yesterday. One of the tallest buildings in the city, and highest on the southern end of the island, it provided the ideal point to observe the keep and the walls fencing it in. Smaller groups of gunners were assembling around the cannon dotted atop the walls, and the keep's battlements, readying to fire. Daniel supposed he shouldn't have been surprised by the large crowd at the top of the three skyscrapers where the best view of the widely anticipated cruiser would be. So much for a discreet early morning approach from the Roebuck. It seemed the fort's residents took the upcoming battle as seriously as their bickering leaders. That was, not at all. Sheer recklessness, throwing themselves into harm's way for the sake of a fiery spectacle. Looking through the binos, Daniel turned his attention back to a blaster cannon on the wall. He zoomed in, turning the wheel jutting from the binos right with his thumb. The binos automatically focused as he did so, scratches and bumps in the metal of the cannon's barrel over a kilometre away becoming clear. While Daniel's eyes were pressed against individual eyepieces, the viewing lens two hand lengths away formed a single rectangle. 
That was the unique design of the tactical terrain scanners, differentiating them from normal binoculars. All the soldiers he knew preferred the much catchier name of dinos, which was fine by him. Since the name was shorter, less time was consumed talking about them. Less time, less risk, less death. The main thing they should all be aiming for. Daniel pressed the button atop the binos' left-hand side, and his view through the binos of the cannon and the men flashed light blue. Most of the sudden colour faded instantly, except for the cannon, the outlines remaining the same blue shade. Daniel clicked the button again, and a box of text appeared next to the cannon, linked to its outline by a blue arrow. A 250 kilowatt Mark 13. It was the strongest blaster cannon of the freelancers Daniel had seen, and even this model was outdated. Sustained cannon fire from this wattage would take down a Stratus-class cruiser, but the Roebuck had circled around the island and was coming in from the north, over Prosperity's volcanic mountain. There were a few patrol boats there, equipped with legionnaire charger cannons too weak to penetrate the cruiser's armour in a short time. Everything should be alright. Then why this doubt in his chest? Daniel felt himself frown as he squinted through the binos. He lowered them and massaged the lines on top of his forehead. They were getting deeper each year, far broader than they should be at a man his age. Maybe he was worrying too much. That's what his ex-girlfriends all agreed on. Paranoid, they'd called him. He never had been one for switching off his brain. Relationships, ageing, politics, bills, his diet, and of course, his state of happiness all made persistent appearances in the daily press of concerns grating through his head. That's where joining the military had come in handy. An environment where a consistent focus and re-evaluation of tactics, terrain, supplies, morale, weather conditions, camp locations, and every little thing in between had proved time and time again to contribute to the survival of his squad rather than hinder it. All that seemed unnecessary today. He just couldn't see a way for the freelancers to bring down the Roebuck. However, his mind being what it was, concerns still weighed him down. Conway was one. He hadn't trusted him from the moment he'd been spotted on Bayou's drone. Daniel had insisted the man was an imposter, bait to lure them in, but Noah had gone ahead with the captain's orders, plunging them all into this mayhem. And now Jeff and Oben were dead. Unacceptable. Thankfully, Private Lockhart would be keeping an eye on Conway today. It was clear James didn't quite fit in with the rest of the squad, which was why Daniel had tried to include him in the strategy discussion yesterday. Unfortunately, Noah seemed to harbour a dislike towards James, which he'd always been quick to do towards soldiers unwilling to contribute their all. That wasn't necessarily a bad thing. James being maligned by Noah, Conway's biggest advocate, would ensure James took his surveillance of the newcomer seriously. And then there was something else that bothered Daniel. He looked to the sky above the black mountain, laden with a tarp of grey clouds. That should have been to the Alliance's advantage, but the sky had looked the same last time their gunship had flown into prosperity. The precision of the flak cannon piercing through the clouds to burst directly next to the gunship had been incredible. How had the freelancers been able to track it so accurately? Wit watched Parker press his eyebrow, conjuring a small square of translucent green in front of his right eye. He rolled his shoulders as he did so, reminded Wit of his own burning torso. All of Wit's body burned. He'd been hitting the gym hard since the funeral. Less aerobics and more weights. More reps piled on top of that, until he'd felt the muscles near rip apart. He'd long stopped doing it for results. There were some looks couldn't be fixed. Instead, he craved the distraction. Like other men's need for drink, food or sex, exercise was his comfort zone. Helped stave off the dread that had been pressing in Strong's absence. And besides, there existed worse distractions than working out. Shame the pool here was empty. Swimming was one of the healthiest routines out there. Wit wondered why no one had ever bothered to fill it in. 
he'd certainly be willing to pay for entry. What do you think? asked Parker as he looked to the skies with that green square of his. He stood with Wit and Fenn, noticeably distant from his team of gunners. Wit sighed when he saw Fenn's shirt beneath his unzipped jacket, with Weo Salvacheo plastered across it. Fenn, predictably, didn't seem to think much. It looks like you're wearing half a traffic light on your face. Not of this! Parker's scowl only reached his mouth, eyes twinkling. I mean of the upcoming battle! How do you think we're going to take down the Roebuck? How do you know its name? asked Wit, filling in the obvious question when it became clear Fenn was more interested in yawning than talking. It was spotted flying above the Lugo apartments a few days ago. The AMF Roebuck. Alliance Military Fleet Roebuck. Wit fought, automatically completing the abbreviation. It's a twin-gun Stratus-class cruiser, announced Parker, like a sports commentator hyping up the season's hottest player. The smallest class in the Alliance fleet, but that doesn't take away from the fact that cruiser's still a cruiser, something you do not want to be on the wrong side of. Now, if we were dealing with a Cumulus, or even an Alto Stratus class cruiser, that would be another matter. Weighing in at four guns- Wait a minute, interrupted Fenn, holding up a hand as if to calm an eager puppy. It's too early in the morning for a full-blown spiel about the entire Alliance fleet. Stick to the Roebuck, or I'm going to need more than a coffee to stay awake. I'm insulted, Fenn, but if you insist. Parker clasped his hands together and plastered a mischievous grin to his face. So, how do you deal with our uninvited guest? One entirely made of Martesian steel? That's not right. Parker's scowl towards Wit was a lot more genuine. Oh, so our new friend thinks I'm wrong, does he? You are about the steel. I didn't realise we had an expert with us. Wit didn't know about Expert, but one of his summers had been spent repairing an Alliance cruiser. He used to work in construction, back when it paid more to build things rather than tear them apart. Exposed to the sun's rays and Berean's mercy, the long, grinding hours used to bore him. How he longed for boredom to be his biggest problem again. It's only the outside of the cruiser, the armour, that's made from steel. The inside framework and rooms are made from aluminium. Parker rolled his eyes. On normal boats, sure, but we're talking about military vessels here. Why not use Martesian steel when it's lighter than aluminium? It's too valuable, said Wit, cutting back Parker's growing annoyance with a forced coolness. I know the insurgency build their cruisers entirely out of the Martesian stuff, but the Alliance don't have the same supply. Oh, look at that, Parker, said Fenn, nudging him in the ribs. Seems the student has become the teacher. He knows too much to be a student of mine, said Parker, all playfulness gone from his voice. Great. He'd managed to piss someone else off. Seemed he was good at that. Normally, that would bother Wit, but today he was too distracted. He heard more voices grow from the deck below, and as the noise built, so did the press of dread. Crowds gave her more room to hide. He slowly turned, hoping he was wrong, confirming he wasn't. That's the thing about hope. You tend to use it when being wrong's all the more likely. There, at the lower deck's back, beyond the mingling, chatting observers, a figure leant against a wall. A woman dressed in a white cloak and hood. Wit reached a hand down, gripping the grenade hanging from his belt for a slim source of comfort. He only faintly heard Fenn and Parker next to him. You want the rest of this coffee? Sorry, mate. I can't stand that Gigor Manio's crap. Oh, go on. I promise it's not that bad. The hood's shadows covered her eyes, but the mouth was left, as always, poking out from beneath, smiling. Wit's skin itched, the pulse under his ears quickened. He must have been imagining that smile. There was no way he could make out that much detail from so far. She was here to see the cruiser. 
Surely it wasn't to follow him. Surely it wasn't like every other day since the Battle of the Spydroid. The lurking, the constant silence, the never-ending smile waiting to strike whenever he turned his head. An enthusiastic cheer ensued from the crowd as bodies were turned and faces tilted upwards. Wit turned with them, eager for something to distract, and saw that the freelancers were applauding the arrival of their enemy from the distant clouds. Cruisers had been around for decades, flying in the skies above Wit for all his life, though it still felt surreal on the rare occasions when he saw one in action. Alliance cruisers were designed to fly into the skies and beyond, although the fuel costs of constant flight were enormous, so they spent most of their time sailing atop the ocean's waves. So it didn't seem to be a spacecraft approaching from above, but a flying boat. It was designed like a catamaran, with two hulls running parallel to one another, connected in the middle by the main body of the ship, where the two main blaster cannons sat atop the deck, one at either end, separated by the raised bridge in the middle. He could see the forward cannon now, twinkling directly above the centre of the two hulls as the cruiser poked itself out of the clouds. A flying beacon of might and destruction, one of a fleet that he had helped build. It seemed small now, but that's the benefit of distance. Even death looks small when it's far away. So, Fen, said Parker, the cheer back in his voice. What's your second name? It's just Fen. Very well, Mr. Fen. Tell me, why do you think our lovely pool down there is empty? To save on water rates. Right attitude, although fortunately for us, that's the wrong answer. Parker flipped open his gauntlet. Copy, Veer. Copy! This is Bruce! Enough of that! It's time! Bring her up! A groaning rumble shook the floor, making Fen jump and Parker laugh at the startled movement. What nonsense is this? asked Fen, lifting one foot at a time to look underneath them. He was talking about the pool, genius, said Wit as he turned towards the pool lying to the right of the puzzled crowd on the lower deck. He grasped the railing, leant forward to get a better look. So that was why he'd never heard of anyone filling the pool. Wasn't so empty now. Paranoid. That was it. How many times had he been told he was worrying over nothing? The cruiser was well in range of the keep's charger weapons, and a few of the blaster cannon could make a far-fetched attempt at firing, but nothing had moved. Not even as the cruiser began to descend, the last clumps of cloud slipping away to reveal the roebuck's light grey body, its twin hull undersides painted light blue beneath their black water lines. Daniel thought of all the crew contained in that flying metal box. Captain Davidson and her team on the bridge, constantly fussing Kirkwood and her crew of engineers, and then the remaining eight soldiers, all of them younger than himself. Looked like they would have a chance to outlive him yet. Daniel swiveled the binos towards the walls. Double, triple checked that the guns weren't being readied to fire. He twisted where he lay, grasping his helmet and lifting it over the 40 kilowatt Amico sniper rifle. He wouldn't be needing it after all. The long barreled sniper had been a pain to carry up here too. Sergeant Black? Daniel asked, his voice muffled and echoey in the helmet. Corporal Wainwright, report. No activity, sir. A crowd is gathered to watch, but none of the guns have been touched. It looks like they're shying from this fight. Even through the helmet's scratchy comms channel, Noah's sigh of relief was audible. Great work, Daniel. We've nearly reached the stadium. Get over here ASAP, unless you want to stay for an extended vacation on this island. Daniel chuckled. You know what, sir? I think it's about time we all went home. There was a pause, and Daniel knew the sergeant was smiling on the other end of the line. See you soon, Daniel. Daniel felt a swelling in his chest as he released the comms button. Sure, there were still problems to deal with, like the whole Conway situation. 
there'd always be more obstacles down the road, and it had taken most of Daniel's twenties to realise one thing. When you're feeling good, even for the smallest of moments, you let that mood last for as long as possible. Then it ended. A glint caught Daniel's eye, to his right, not from the walls, but from the top of the three skyscrapers and the cruiser on their heads. He quickly grabbed the binos, raising them to his helmet's visor. The image wasn't as good without the eyeglasses pressed directly to his eyes, but there was no time to take off his helmet. The glint he'd seen was silvery, sunlight flashing off polished metal. Then he saw it, behind the crowd, rising out of the replica cruiser's deck. The same replica James had pointed out before Noah shot him down. Daniel's hand shot back to his jaw. As he pressed the comms button on his helmet, another glint caught his attention. A white one, coming from the city. But the enemy was directly ahead, and the light was high, on top of a... Fuck. Daniel tried to push himself back into cover. Knew it was already too late. Paranoid? No. He should have worried more. The distant soldier's head exploded. His helmet tried to put up the good fight, but it caved in and cracked pretty quick. Pretty quick as in instantly. At least it kept most of the mess in. Blood oozed out of a few places, the seeping pool a good alternative to the blood-splattered, brain-strewn mess Torben had seen so many times before. That might have been the result had Torben used another weapon type. One that required several shots to break through the helmet's steel. Fortunately, although that depended on whose perspective was looking, Torben used a laser rifle for the job. He'd heard Parker, buffoonish and self-satisfied as ever, bragging about his charger guns and blaster cannon. Good weapons if you were in the artillery business, but Torben had been in the game far longer than Parker, and he knew the best tools for the job. Say what you want about the reformists, and Torben had as negative an opinion on them as one could get, but they definitely made the best weapons. The sniper hadn't made a sound when it fired, emitting a single, white line that travelled at the speed of light and shattered the enemy's retreating head in half a breath. It was a gun so terrifyingly effective that an amateur would wonder why the main factions hadn't adopted an entire arsenal of laser weaponry. That's a reform party for you, always developing the newest gear, and Torben had heard rumour of a new reformist project in the works, more advanced than all that came before. He'd have to keep an eye on that. But here's the thing about the bleeding edge of technology. It's just too damn expensive, and too bloody troublesome to use on a widespread basis, as shown by Torben's sniper, nearly out of charge after one shot. Mind you, it had been programmed that way. Torben spotted the Alliance scout half an hour before the cruiser made its appearance, in the exact same spot he'd been yesterday. Soldiers are creatures of habit after all. Torben had waited, ensuring his weapon was set right, lining up the man's chest with his single, working eye. Left eye oriented by process of elimination, as his old partner used to joke always brought a smile to Torben's lips before he squashed it down as the bloody business went underway. Did he feel bad about this particular man's demise? Not really. Torben glanced to the cairn of stones where his favourite compass used to sit. Someone had stolen it. Superglue didn't come undone with a light breeze. And why not blame that man? Even if he wasn't responsible, the whole petty chapter could now be closed in his mind. Torben pulled the flaps of his Yushanka fervor over his ears. Slowly stood, his cold, old bones clicking, lifting the resting sniper by its elongated scope. The weapon transformed as he did so, snapping and folding closed, metal parts sliding and shifting into one another, until the scope Torben held had become a handle for a white metal briefcase. So easy to carry this way. Torben was of an age where taking the hard way in life, for the hard way's sake, had long lost its appeal. Torben spat a black gob of snooze on the floor. 
glanced at the approaching cruiser, getting bigger and lower with each minute. The battle was far from over, but his work was done. He'd been told to keep Parker's fancy new gun a secret for as long as possible, to pick the optimum moment. Torben looked to the top of the three skyscrapers with their ridiculous cruiser-shaped roof before grunting and starting the long walk down. He'd picked well. This couldn't have happened at a worse moment. The cruiser was nearly at the city. So near, Michael heard the soft rumble of the engines overhead, and Daniel had suddenly gone silent. Sergeant Black talked into his helmet, trying to keep the desperation out of his voice as his pleas for a response went unanswered. Noah didn't need telling what it meant when the steadfast scout suddenly went quiet. Michael understood they'd been close, but Sergeant Black couldn't let his composure break now, not in front of the squad. He could see the panic spreading in the six armoured soldiers stood in the middle of the street, the stadium and its broken white wall waiting a hundred metres ahead of them. He didn't need to see their faces. Bayou and Kai's tense movements, Lisa, Sonny and James's unnatural stillness told it all. Chase didn't seem concerned, but overconfidence can be its own shield. This moment was crucial. The pressure had increased, and the squad's metal was being tested. Would they stand the heat, or break, and run to where the fighting wasn't? Michael felt more annoyed than anything else. He'd gotten carried away with the early good news, had let himself look forward to getting out of here. This wasn't his fight. These small-time bandits, the freelancers, weren't responsible for killing his brother. They weren't behind any of it. The insurgency, led by this trium whatever were his true enemy. Out here, every life spent, every cell fired, was another asset spent on the wrong cause. Michael couldn't get angry. Let yourself obsess on the lives and resources wasted in war, and you'll never get past the first day of combat. It was time to act, to get off this island, and on to the real fight. Sergeant... Michael said, walking to Noah, using a respectfully firm tone. We have to stay strong. He swung the arm nine from his shoulder, holding it to reinforce his words. This wasn't only for the sergeant, it was for the whole squad to hear. The corporal might have gone dark, but we can't let that stop us. It would be a betrayal to him if we did. Michael, I mean, Conway... The sergeant said, making himself stand a little taller. What can we do? If they take down our cruiser, then... Then we think of another way to come out on top, Michael said, cutting off the sergeant before he started listing negatives. Voicing the what-ifs in life only give you more hurdles to overcome. Don't worry, sir. We're in a stronger position than you think. I have the ability to... Michael's tongue burned. Not a lot but it felt like a hot serving of soup had been applied to its surface. Just hot enough to make his face sweat and his teeth clench. Enough for him to get the message. Conway? Noah asked. Michael had to think quick, before his distress became obvious. The best way to deal with stumbled words is to pick them up again with a plan. The stadium, Michael said, turning to the towering walls. That's where our best position still lies. We need to stick to the plan and secure the area. Better than standing out here in the open, waiting for the freelancers to decide the day for us. You're right, Noah said, turning and lifting his chest high. Everyone, advance on the stadium. We don't know what happened to Corporal Wainwright, but we can't let that stop us. A few relieved nods came from the squad as they began to move, Michael right in their midst. He needed to get away from the others. Then he talked to the meddling voice in his head and figure out a way to save the ship. There was no way to save the ship now. Parker saw that as clearly as the cruiser's mast atop the bridge, its shadow passing from Black Mountain to Grey City. The Roebuck wasn't very large. It was a Stratus class after all, less than half the length of the replica Nimbus they stood on. An older model, too. 
They had a side-on view of the cruiser, and the two rotatable guns on top stood out for their shininess, newer than the rest of the Roebuck's worn facade. The engines were another tell. The two visible to Parker, main at the back, and smaller spurt of blue flame from the bow thruster at the front, weren't as big as the newer versions of the Stratus class. Oh well, incremental details. The ship would go down all the same. Oh great, this guy. Parker turned to see who Fem was complaining about. Out of the whole crowd, Fem was the only one showing no interest in the spectacle rising from the pool. A man clambered his way onto the higher deck. One Parker couldn't kick out due to health and safety reasons, because of the full-length trousers and high-visibility shirt he wore. Same as Parker's, except for the bright red colour. He needn't have bothered coming, the newcomer said to Fen, stroking his exceedingly long beard. There's no seats here for you to steal. That's a shame. Looks like you'll have to stand with us little people for once. Gentlemen, Parker said, plastering on an oh-so-pleasant smile for the squabbling kids. It's far too early to bicker, wouldn't you agree? You were at this morning's meeting, I believe. Aye, the man said, sounding like a proper pirate with that gravelly voice. I'm Rick, second in charge of the wielders. So, the wielders' chief wouldn't be turning up then. Shame. Even Sadie, massive as she was, would have made some welcome female company. There were a lot of blokes around today. Rick and Fenn continued to glower at each other in some old grumpy man ritual, and the gloomy bugger with the clamp hand, wit, wasn't helping things, looking more put out than a eunuch at a brothel. Why couldn't there be more pretty ladies like Charlene about? Probably because he kept pissing them off. Although Parker found that pissing off women and keeping them interested were remarkably similar achievements. You look at ease. Rick said, stuffing his hands into his pockets in that old geezer fashion of trying to hide as much from the chill as possible. You're not worried about them sending gunships? Not at all, Parker said. He turned towards the Roebuck. They only have one more gunship tucked away in that cruiser, and they're not going to launch it unless we send one of our own. You'll find this battle very tit-for-tat in that way. Happens when the other side doesn't really want to fight. Hmm... Back in my day, when an enemy didn't want to fight, we often kept it that way. Parker gave Rick a sidelong glance. Your point being? Notice Arminius ain't here. You got to ask yourself, is it really worth more bloodshed when the one hell-bent on fighting isn't even present? I didn't realise the jagged fort hosted such noble objectors to violence. Rick shrugged. Just us few have seen a bit too much in our day. All a fair argument, but Parker had his bonus to think about. There's being moral, and then there's being self-sacrificing to the point of stupidity. Sorry, pal. We'll have to save the soul-searching questions for after the money's been counted. Now, Fen! Parker said, turning towards more exciting conversation. He enjoyed these interactions with Fen. You never knew what the collection of wispy white hair and sardonic quibbles would say next. What do you think of our new cannon? Fenn casted a sceptical eye. I've seen smaller ones. A deliberate understatement of Parker had ever heard one. Where the empty pool once sat, there was now a long, track-wheeled truck. And even longer than that was the monstrous blaster cannon on top that came level with the crowd. The enormous ten-metre barrel towered high over their heads. It was comparable to an industrial chimney angled into the sky, complete with a hydraulic arm at its base to crane in the huge blaster cells. Veer sat inside the truck's cab, his apprentice pink shirt visible through the thick glass. You see, Fen, despite what I tell the ladies, size does matter. In this case, all 2,200 kilowatts of it. Ten times bigger than a normal 250 kilowatt blaster cannon. It's actually 8.8 .8 times bigger. Don't you get smart with me too, Parker said, feeling his mood sour. He hated being upstaged in the middle of a speech. Get your maths right and I won't have to. 
Oh, I don't need to worry about being right. Not when I have the Cruiser Crippler at my side. What a friendly sounding sidekick. Veer, Parker said into his gauntlet, ignoring the sarcastic snipe. Are we ready to fire? Yes, bro. The cruiser's bridge is nearly in my line of fire. What? Christ, I said aim for the bow thruster. Are you trying to take out the entire crew? What? what? No, of course not. Veer gave a strangled laugh. That was a joke. The grinding sound of gears spinning and wheels turning confirmed Veer was readjusting the cannon's aim before he committed mass murder. That boy. Hopefully his enthusiasm for blowing apart ships and buildings would tamper down when he saw what lay in the results. It had worked for Parker, mostly, although he looked forward to this. The cruiser crippler was gigantic, even bigger than the Alliance's infamous Mark II's. It was a wonder Arminius had been able to get his hands on it. Definitely not via legal means, given the black blaster cells that came with it. Hopefully none exploded in the gun itself when fired. One of the gunner crew handed out earplugs and Parker gave Veer the go-ahead before sliding on his own earmuffs. The cruiser crippler's firing alarm shrieked, an ear-piercing sound that made the crowd plug their ears before the cannon burst their eardrums. Parker glanced back at the cruiser. It was so close he saw the number, 315, painted on its hull the air shimmering around the flaming blue engines. Seemed the handyman had disposed of the scouts spotted snooping around yesterday. Bugger, Torben was expensive, but Parker knew from his own invoices how valuable the right staff were. After all, the cruiser crippler was a discouraging sight, and the Alliance cruiser would have stayed far from the towers if not for the lazy-eyed man. What was Veer waiting for? Parker turned, Saw Fenn trying to offer his crap cup of coffee to Rick. Oi! You're going to miss! The truck jumped, the cannon on top shooting back quicker than the blaster shot flung from its end. Those standing closest to the cannon stumbled and fell back as the vibrations hit. Even through the protectors, the skull-thumping pound whacked at his ears, but Parker was too distracted to care. He whipped his head around, watching the glaring blaster shot, a miniature black sun, zipped through the sky, a slight curve to its path. It slammed into the cruiser's starboard hull, just left of where the number had been sitting. It bore into the armour, instantly splitting it, followed by another, ear-shattering crash as the blaster shot exploded, spewing out of the hull's other side in a luminescent black cloud. Parker took a staggered step back from the dazzling bloom of black light and grinned. They would have felt that one. Goodness gracious me, that felt awful. Alice opened her eyes and confirmed it wasn't only her hands holding onto the console with white knuckles that had stopped shaking. The whole bridge settled once more, windows no longer shuddering, linoleum floor finished trembling. That hadn't been some pesky piece of turbulence. A hit! They had been hit! Goodness above, this shouldn't be happening. Alice had been told this would be a scouting mission, coupled by a diplomatic exchange with the freelancers to make the journey worthwhile. In her first week aboard the Roebuck, Alice's biggest stress had been wondering how well she was getting along with the captain. Her biggest headache replying to unsuccessful message after unsuccessful message as she tried selling her crap car back in New Wellington. All inconsequential fluff compared to this? The threat of death? She couldn't handle it. Goodness, never mind her, the ship couldn't handle it. There wasn't even a lieutenant aboard, and with one gunship remaining, there wouldn't be enough space to... What happened? Captain Davidson's cool, neutral tone soothed the herd stampeding in Alice's head. She swiveled in her chair and saw Rebecca Davidson in the same pose as before, standing at the centre of the bridge, hands clasped behind her back, black, grey-streaked ponytail poking out from beneath her captain's hat all unmoved from the body-flinging tremor that had rocked the ship. Alice shouldn't have been surprised. Davidson was unshakable, even when the world was hauled around her. A blaster cannon, ma'am. 
called a man's voice from the far end of the row of consoles, running the length of the bridge. I thought we were out of range, Davidson asked. The freelancers fired it from the cruiser on top of the skyscrapers. I swear, it wasn't there yesterday. The drone would have seen it. From the cruiser, you say? Davidson looked through the bridge's tinted windows at the city skyline, which was tilting from flat to a much more uncomfortable angle. So, you're saying they were hiding in plain sight? She chuckled at her own comment. Alice caught the eye of the man at the next console, glad to see he looked as alarmed as she at the captain's reaction. Kirkwood. Yes, ma'am, Alice said, straightening in her chair. We're tilting. Alice's bum, sliding off the seat, hastened to agree. Why is that? Um, one sec, Alice mumbled, looking to her screen. She didn't need to be head engineer to see there was far too much red on it. The sensors were going haywire, each flash and beep like a bunch of kids, all trying to cry loudest for the last snack. The silly things only worked in normal flight, and that was when they felt like it. The ship had taken a hit, and now the sensors were worse than useless, and here she'd been, thinking it was the simulations that were broken. A computerised voice spoke calmly over the wailing bleeps for all the bridge to hear. Starboard bow thruster compromised. The captain turned her head to Alice, eyebrow raised. Yes, ma'am, Alice said, unsure what she was saying yes to. She hurried out of the bridge and down the stairs, nearly tripping on the third step as she went. Goodness, her feet hurt. Why hadn't she found the nerve to ask for a refit when the new shoes she received hadn't fit? Better question yet, why had she said yes to this promotion in the first place? Well, because becoming head engineer meant moving to a smaller cruiser, and smaller cruisers saw less action, or had the officers lied to her again? Ah, sorry, Alice shrieked as she nearly bowled over a wide-eyed soldier at the bottom of the stairs. Apologising? Now? She should be getting to the bow thruster. She scrambled down the right-hand ladder, leading into the bowels of the ship's starboard hull, nearly slipping on the third rung this time. Her chest began to constrict as her breathing became ragged, her pumping arms tired. At least she was grateful for the smaller size of the Stratus-class cruisers. The Nimbus cruiser she'd served on before dwarfed this one. It had been an absolute pain crossing one end to the other, but on this ship she could already feel the heat as she reached the door to the forward engine room. Feel the heat? That wasn't something to be grateful for. She shouldn't be feeling any heat from here. Alice grabbed the door handle, yelped and let go when the metal burned her hands. She whipped off her jacket uniform, exposing her bare, regrettably flabby arms to a radiating warmth, and used the jacket as a flappy oven mitt to turn the handle. She yelped again as a tongue of flame leapt through the doorway, licking up the new oxygen source. Get back! A stream of white, frothy foam gushed past, leaving streaks on Alice's arms as Gary edged forward, beating back the fire with the extinguisher's spray. He rested the blue-banded extinguisher on the raised doorway, sweeping the angrily hissing nozzle at the base of the flames. There was foam everywhere. Why couldn't he have used the dry powder extinguisher and save on the cleaning later? Goodness sake, why was she worrying about the mess? Good job, Gar Gary, good, good job, Alice stammered, flapping her burnt hands in a vain attempt to cool them. She didn't have time today to worry about why Gary had such a dubious look on his face. She had to take the initiative. That was what good team leaders did, wasn't it? Follow me, Alice said, trying to stuff some authority into her voice. And bring that extinguisher. It's empty. Oh, never mind, just come on. Alice climbed through the door, stumbling and cursing, as she always did, at the ludicrously high bottom of the doorframe. Gary came in behind her, muttered, We're so screwed. Whether he was talking about the hole in the side of the ship or the woman in charge of patching it, he didn't say. The ship's armour had been dealt a god-awful punch. 
not only from the initial impact of the blaster cannon, but also from the blowback of the explosion and sucking air, rending an even bigger hole in the other side of the hull. High-altitude winds whipped in and out of the new makeshift windows, thrashing Alice's shoulder-length hair into a slapping frenzy against her cheeks. The wind switched from howling menace to whisking scream as a new buffet tried to break the other, ripping through the exposed patches of armour and tugging at Alice on the way back out. Acrid smoke from the burnt-out engine whisked itself into the chaos, stinging her eyes. Alice grabbed one of the few intact railings as her legs were pulled this way and that, trying not to concentrate on how little of the grid mesh walkway remained between her and that roaring gap of sky. A sky flush with skyscrapers and awfully solid ground beneath, lurching closer and closer to meet them. The one bad thing about the ship's three still operating engines was the long, doom-filled delay they made as the Roebuck took its leisurely time floating towards its inevitable crash. That was, unless she could do something to stop it. Alice looked away from the yawning mouth and towards the bow thruster. It was dead, not damaged, but not producing flame or power either. She turned up the railing, flinging one hand after the other, desperately grasping the slippery smooth metal until her entire body, including her deplorably large belly, faced the shaking mass of engines below. It wasn't an inspiring sight, even with the fires put out. The main force of the blast had entered at an angle, shearing the top of the right-hand engine powering the thruster. Cylinders were melted and gaskets flung apart in random bits. The main block had been hacked in half and the timing belt vanished in the process to goodness knows where. A few bubbles of dirty black oil continued to blow out of a hole that should never have been there, but otherwise the engine was utterly spent, winding its way down to a lifeless hunk of metal. She didn't like thinking it, but what else could be said? It was fucked. However, there was still hope in the second engine. The blast had missed it, and it still worked away, turbocharger whirring and pistons pumping. The side plate had been removed, so the internal components could be viewed for this exact scenario, and Alice spotted the problem after a few seconds. If her years as a somewhat half-hearted mechanics apprentice had taught her anything, it was to simply look for what wasn't moving. The crankshaft leading on to the bow thruster. It had disconnected from the pistons when the connecting rods rattled loose during the explosion. Someone hadn't screwed them on right, but that was okay. She could fix this. Alice hit the engine stop button, bringing the pointless commotion, or at least some of it, to an end. She slid from the walkway, slid being a gracious term for the actual ungainly tumble. She got onto her knees and went to push back her sleeves, touching only her smart gauntlets before remembering she'd taken off her jacket. Her mind flashed back to the damage repair instructional units, the glorified giant metal boxes she'd trained within in New Wellington's Upper Hut district. She'd gone through an exact run-through of this situation before. Okay, Gary, Alice shouted over the wailing winds at the gormless face peeking down from the railing. I need a... She stared at the tangle of skewed arms and shafts. A new rod cap, 14mm nuts and bolts, and a socket set. Uh, where are they? Alice stared back up, aghast at the last question you want to hear from your assistant. Which part? All of them. A rare anger boiled in Alice. Do you not remember your training? I thought this was meant to be my training. Now? He was getting defensive now? Snide, self-absorbed, condescending Gary. For all his boyish arrogance, he'd turned out to be as useful as a straw ratchet. Why couldn't he have gone down to the island and left Bayou in his stead? There should be some bolts in the boarding party room. I'll get the cap and socket set in the... Alice trailed off as she realised where they were the rear engine room, at the far end of the ship. She didn't trust Gary to find them, and who was Alice kidding? She was no athlete. 
She glanced behind, wind bashing her watering eyes, as she looked up the approaching city, tips of the skyscrapers perilously close. The cold air made her realise how sweaty her shirt had become, and just after she'd freshly washed it, she opened her gauntlet. No luck? Despite the captain's calm voice, Alice still winced. No, ma'am. We need to aim for the open space in the stadium. And why's that, Kirkwood? Because this ship is going down. Hard. Very well. All non-essential crew are to board the gunship and evacuate, just in case. Alice looked up at Gary, who'd been listening in. He cast Alice one quick glance, then took off through the door. Goodness gracious, never had Alice felt worse for being considered essential. The roebuck turned, pointing its smoking bow eastwards and giving Parker a view of its two rear engines, each with a twin pair of exhausts spewing bright blue streams of fire. The cruiser's back ramp opened, letting an alliance mana, the same he'd chased away three days ago, teeter out. The gunship swayed with the ship as its pilot avoided the cruiser's walls, which continued to tilt alarmingly to the starboard side. Stability tended to be an issue with a wrecked bow thruster. Parker hummed, tapping a finger on top of his crossed bicep, listening to the manna's engines roar to life as they left the cruiser's shadow. It reminded him of overpowered car engines. It had been too long since he'd gone for a proper scenic drive. No chance of having one here, where every road on the island was clogged with more debris than a demolition yard. Perhaps he could get a pass and travel to New Wellington. There were some nice roads in the hills once you got away from the city's monolithic motorways. It would be tricky getting permission from the Alliance after this, but that was just a pesky detail. He pictured it now, cruising along in a nice convertible, cool breeze and warm sunlight brushing the top of his head a young woman in the passenger seat to lap up the good times with him, after she was finished playing in his lap, that was. Should we do something about that gunship? Wit, with the broken hand and broken name to boot, asked from the little entourage. The mana? Parker asked, stifling a yawn nearly as wide as one of Fen's. Daydreaming about girls was much more fun than focusing on this war stuff. No need to worry, our cannons will keep them at bay. The crisp smell of the cruiser crippler's blaster discharge continued to linger, a veritable improvement on the stench of roasted gunpowder that charger guns liked to leave behind. We'll be saving our own gunship for the upcoming ground battle. Ground battle? For a man making a living off fighting, Wit didn't look very pleased to hear about extra work coming his way. Of course, we can't scoop up Conway until we fight our way through a couple dozen of his alliance pals. Wit looked positively sick now. You don't seem too concerned. Why do you think I work in artillery? Parker winked. I'm a much smaller target sitting back here. That's good news, Fenn said, slapping the muscly back, oblivious to the pain-stricken woe written on Wit's face. You love getting stuck into battles, like at the spy droid. Shame I won't be there to see you in action. What are you talking about? You'll be there too. Me? I'm not a frontliner. No, but Bingo told us he wants you fighting on the battlefield to make up for recent hostilities. Fenn snorted, as if Billy would agree to that. He did. Good one, pal. I'm not joking. For once, Parker honestly meant it. Fenn looked from him to Wit, ghost of a smile frozen on his face. Then he dropped his coffee, splashing the last dribbles onto the deck. You spilt your coffee, Wit said solemnly. Fuck the coffee, Fenn muttered, face paler than Wit's. The hydraulic arm behind them whirred as it hoisted the next blaster cell into place. Loading again, Rick asked, a fresh breeze playing with the many loose strands in his beard. You got a mind to blow that ship completely out of the sky? Parker eyed the invitingly slow cruiser heading ever closer to the ground, gunship trailing after it like a cub pining for its mother. If that had been an insurgency ship, he would have given Veer the go-ahead. Clones and droids weren't worth the cells and bolts they came from, 
but this was different. He had instructions from Arminius to use extreme force, but that mad bastard wasn't here, and he was somewhat sympathetic towards the Alliance. He'd served with them before, and besides, he wanted that visitor's pass for New Wellington. Blowing up a ship filled with its citizens might get in the way of that. There would be more death coming to both sides if he let that cruiser land, but he'd learnt that trying to preempt a future catastrophe with a present one was a sub-par solution. Calm yourself, bud, Parker said, waving away more of Rick's imminent preaching. This is only a precaution. I'm not going to shoot the buggers down and take away another chance for Fearsome to earn his glory. I should have stayed in bed, Fenn mumbled. Parker gazed back at the sinking cruiser dipping into the city's cap of craggy high-rises. He began fantasizing on where he'd spend his money on payday. After all, why fixate on the monotony of today when you can dream of the fun tomorrow? Michael ran through the gap blown into the arena's wall and onto the overgrown pitch. He stopped and struck out a hand, halting the squad coming behind him. They had to make way. Make way for the warship hitting the ground. The damaged hull hit the pitch first, with no power from the bow thruster to hold it up. It came in at a slight angle, creating a horrendous crunch as it tore into the stadium floor, the rest of the cruiser sliding in behind as tons upon tons of steel ripped up the ground. Michael was forced into a kneeling stance as the bulk of the cruiser sent a trembling bang through the earth, shaking the floor. The streaks of fire from the back engines tilted downwards, burning great black lines into the damp foliage as the cruiser tried to slow its descent. Then, the second hull rammed the ground, levelling out the crash with another tremendous boom. It dug into the pitch, spewing wild thickets and shrubs, before striking the harder-packed dirt beneath. The cannons on top swayed, and the mast juddered as the screams of the ship's metal underside filled the arena, until, finally, the cruiser churned to a stop. Michael knew it could have been worse. A lot worse. The approach had been slow and shallow, and the cruiser was left mostly intact. Now he had other problems to worry about. Michael began moving before the high-pitched whine faded from his ears. First power walking, then running, while the squad stared in stunned silence at the wreckage. He skirted into the stands at the side, stopping in the dark corridor that once led into the team's changing rooms. He heard a gunship approaching from above. The Roebuck's backup. This would have to be quick. Flicker, Michael hissed without need. He was sure the voice was listening. Why did you stop me? Why did I stop you from revealing our secret? Flicker spat back, his voice livid. Do you have any idea what's at stake? It's fine if they don't believe your revelation about me. I don't care if you become a major source of mockery and derision, cast as a madman, addled by years spent in stasis. But what if things go the other way? What if they did believe you? I can't have that. Why not? Think, boy, the power to heal oneself at their own whim, to alter and improve the senses upon an individual's disposition. It would bring to light the real capability of creating super soldiers. Exactly, Michael said, keeping his voice low as he listened for footsteps. We can use these powers to help, to do things no one else could. We would become the subjects of experimentation, imprisoned and questioned at best, more plausibly, dissected and killed in the slowest fashion possible under the noble guise of scientific progress. That would be immensely uncomfortable, and I did not save your life to live the rest of mine in agony. This is about more than you and me, Michael said, feeling a righteous anger boil forth. The same that fueled him when facing the Alliance's critics, too narrow-minded to see the bigger picture. With our help, the Alliance can beat the insurgency and win this war. And he could finally avenge his brother. I don't care what you think. I'm going to tell them everything. Flicker fell silent, the quiet of the corridor deafening after his talking. Must have realised the error of his ways. Michael turned to... His head exploded with pain! It spread down his body and suddenly everything was on fire. 
muscles cramped vice tight, skin furiously stinging, organs and bones squeezed as all was transformed into one writhing mass of hurt. A spike, like a sharp, serrated bayonet, stabbed through the pain into the back of his knees. Michael collapsed onto all fours, crying out. Vaguely, he was aware of why this was worse than when he'd entered the spy droid. That time, he'd been tortured to the point of passing out. Now, the sensation was more bearable, all the harder to endure as the evil tides of pain surged through him again and again. Your cause and your ideals are of no interest to me. Pursue them if you must, and I will not obstruct. The words were loud and resounding, impossibly powerful things that strained to break Michael's eardrums despite being calmly spoken in the most dispassionate of tones. But if you choose a different path, if you choose to expose me, then I will burn your tongue to a swollen lump and leave it so. I will curl your fingers in on themselves until they pierce the back of your hands, and I will erode your joints until they can do nothing more than twitch and contract. You've heard the expression, you don't appreciate what you have until it's gone? Test me, and I'll make you an advent disciple of it. The pain let off, just enough for Michael to blink the tears out of his eyes. He could comprehend where he was again, forced onto hands and knees over the cold floor like a cowed beast. I don't care if this squad, if the Alliance, if all humanity were to perish. I would let it all end, so long as I can continue to exist undisturbed. Am I understood? Michael realised he was gasping, flecks of drool spitting from his mouth onto the concrete below. What the fuck lived inside his head? The grip of pain loosened before he could answer. A second later, a noise told him why. Michael lifted his head. The corridor leading into the daylight of the arena was empty, but Michael was certain he'd heard it. An armoured boot clacking against a slab of exposed concrete. Who was that? Don't know, Michael said between laboured breaths. I was distracted. We need to find out who saw us. Are you joking? Help you? Help us? Find out who it was and keep me a secret. In return, I'll do everything I can to improve your body and get all of your new friends off this island. Subtly. Michael saw what was happening. Flicker had tried the stick and now he threw in a carrot for good measure. He didn't like how obvious the method was didn't like how well he felt it working. What the fuck was that? He'd been acting normal enough that day, marching proudly alongside the squad, taking command when the predictably cowardly sergeant panicked, getting all the adoring glances from Lisa without even realising it. Michael had been living up to the Conway legend all right, so James suspected he was up to something when he suddenly snuck off during the cruiser crash. But this? There was no way he could have predicted this. We can use these powers. Powers? With our help. Our? Talking to oneself was strange enough. James had done it often in the orphanage until the other kids bullied him into compliant, normal silence. James's half-spoken motivational speeches and badly hidden, angry mutterings were a world apart from the ramblings coming out of Michael's mouth. It was as if he'd been talking to someone else entirely. There was only one way to explain it. Michael was psychotic. Fuck, you only needed to look at the way he'd been on all fours, gutterly growling at the dirt to work that much out. Daniel was right to be suspicious for all the wrong reasons. The front of the crashed cruiser, the decaled hull number, 315, towering above, came closer. He was faintly aware of that. James was more focused on his legs, putting as much distance between him and the maniac in the corridor as possible. He took off his helmet, cold sweat trickling down his neck, breathing too fast, too shallow, needed to do something quick. 
James? James! Lisa. She had taken her helmet off and shouted his name, some space between them and the rest of the squad. A rope ladder hung from the roebuck's deck and its crew were climbing down to the pitch. That didn't matter. Not when Lisa was over here, right in front of him. Lisa, James said, stopping as he tried to compose himself. Are you okay? Me? She seemed confused. Of course, you? She does care about me. Before he could answer, she asked, Have you seen Michael? And like that, the excitement was gone. The building panic back. Michael, he's... Lisa had already lost interest. A smile lit her face. The one James had been missing meant for someone else. James turned and saw Michael seemingly back to normal as he walked towards them with a slight frown that would have bothered him a lot less ten minutes ago. Michael, Lisa said, the relief in her voice painful to hear. Where did you go? I thought I saw someone approaching and I went to investigate. Michael looked from Lisa to James. Back again. Was he suspicious? James was sure he hadn't been seen. Captain Davidson's here. She'll want to meet you. Michael nodded, giving James one last look before he went. Why was he so much more intimidating now? Surely the discovery of Michael being mad was better than one of treachery. James had to tell Wainwright what he'd found. Talk with the sergeant or expose Conway himself. Whatever it was, Wainwright would handle it. The crew were gathered in the roebuck's weak shadow, paler than the feeble autumn sun causing it, giving everything a drab look to accompany the chill. The mana descended, its four engines emitting small, sad whines as they wound down, as if the quelling flames were aware of the failure they were joining. Despite this, James was optimistic. He wasn't going to let Lisa's affections for Michael get him down. Not this time. He walked by the head engineer, whose flabby face looked more flustered and redder than usual, and passed the group disembarking from the gunship. Even the sight of that idiot, Gary, who James knew talked shit about him behind his back, couldn't ruin his spirit. He skipped them all, making straight for Sergeant Black, who'd taken his helmet off to talk to the captain. Sir, James said, surprising himself as he came to a smart, marching halt in front of the pair. I need to talk to Corporal Wainwright. His tone was unwavering, adopting a timber he'd never used with the sergeant before. Just try shoot me down, once I and the corporal reveal you for the blind, idolising Conway worshipper you are. James, the sergeant's eyes were rimmed with red, a whitish complexion to his skin. The last readings from Corporal Winwright's gauntlet came in. There was no heartbeat. Wait, Daniel, he's dead. An enemy. The sergeant stopped short and firmly shut his trembling mouth, looking away from James and the grip behind who'd fallen silent. James stared. No. The corporal's gauntlet had only lost signal. He couldn't be. Not the firm, patient man who'd guided them through so much of their training. He couldn't be. Captain Davidson stepped forward. He was killed by the enemy. Her words were clean and precise, loud and unemotional. He was lost in the line of duty, and for that, we all appreciate his actions dearly. He will be sorely missed. Don't act like you knew him. For the first time in years, James felt he'd lost a friend. True, they hadn't talked much, but you take what you can get. Worse than that, he'd lost his one confidant. He looked over at Michael, who seemed unaffected by the news. All the bravado that filled James a few seconds ago vanished. His loss is a great one, the captain continued. We cannot dwell on it. We will mourn him and every other member of this expedition properly once we reach home. But first, we have to get there. And how are we going to do that? Of course, 
Chase was the one to interrupt the captain, shouting from the back of the group and yanking a few angry glares his way. We don't have a cruiser anymore, or am I expected to fly us all home in one tiny gunship? The captain responded with her signature small quirk of the lips. It's time for another plan. The clouds had shifted, allowing speckles of sunlight to shine through and wanely warm Fenn's back. Despite that, he was deflated. Gods, I'm deflated. About the battle we'll have to fight in? Wit asked. It must have been the fresh pair of sunglasses he'd put on that made him seem so despondent. That too, but I'm talking about these. Fenn said, looking down and wiggling the toes in his grey loafers. I spilt coffee all over my shoes. Were they worth much? In price? No. But sentimentally... Would you stop your groaning? Beardy Rick asked, never far from a groan himself. You could have lost a lot more today than the shine on a pair of shoes. We should all be happy with this outcome. I don't see you jumping for joy. Rick's old legs probably wouldn't have let him jump under any emotion-filled circumstances. Besides, what's the point in celebrating when they're doing the job for us? Parker's crew of brightly coloured gunners were having quite the self-congratulatory party, handing out back slaps and cheers amongst Parker's shouts. You get a bonus, and you get a bonus, and of course, yours faithfully gets an extra big fen. I thought there'd be more shouting during the fight, not after. Fenn turned and felt his already dipping mood plummet when he saw Billy on the deck below, beckoning with a single gesture of his furrowed head. Duty calls, Fenn mumbled to wit. Tends to find us all in the end. At least he would be escaping the moody quotes up here. Fenn climbed down the ladder and threaded his way through the crowd, reminiscent of friendly neighbours chatting after a park recital rather than a bunch of war-spectating sadists. Billy gazed at the blaster cannon's barrel stretched far over their heads. We couldn't believe the price of that thing when Arminius brought it last year. Seems the cost has finally been justified. I guess, if blowing up cruisers counts as justifying things. Gods, what was that? The philosophers upstairs must have rubbed off on me. Fair point. Billy turned his head to the deck of jubilant gunners. How'd you get up there? Parker invited me. Oh, I? So you're friends with at least one hollow cloak? Don't know about friends, but we're close enough for him to tell me I'll be fighting today. Billy finally swiveled his eyes around to Fenn. At least he had the good graces to look awkward about sending him to his likely death. This was the best we could do for you, even if it doesn't seem like it. The best? Is the fort fresh out of rope to tie nooses with? You provoked and insulted the hollow cloak second in command. Because of a girl you and Oscar brought him from no man's land, Fenn said, batting the hostility straight back. Where is she anyway? Alone in her room. She can decide when to come out. Isolation gets to everyone eventually. Billy glanced at the group of freelancer higher-ups that had started to huddle, Marie at their helm. Listen, Fenn, we'll have a proper talk later. Come to my office at ten. Fenn shook his head as Billy left, fed up. More meetings. You'd think they'd give me half a day off before my fight to the death. The freelancers had done the unthinkable and taken out an Alliance cruiser. The news would travel the world within hours, but he doubted it would bring anything good. Just one massive headache for the future to worry about medicating. Yo, Fen! Coffee jogged from the direction of the elevators, wearing a neon green headband that separated the border of bushy hair and forehead. Where have you been hiding? although Fenn could guess from the patches of sweat under Coffee's armpits. I went for a morning run, and then I heard some explosions, so I came here. Don't you need a pass to get up here? Yeah, I've always had one. Oh. Did I miss much? Nah, let's go get a drink. At 7am? Oh, right. Fenn stroked his beard in contemplation. 
So, I've got three hours before my talk with Billy. In that case, I'm going to bed. Why not? After all, falling asleep is the best part of the day.